The house of 1999 will be virtually maintenance free. A central atmospheric system will maintain constant year-around temperatures and control humidity, bacteria, pollen, and dust. Hey, podcast listener, even if you are alone in your entrepreneurial journey, know that today, right now in your earbuds, you are joined by thousands of entrepreneurs from all around the globe seeking to grow better, more profitable, location-independent businesses. If you'd like to learn more about what we do and download our entire back catalog, check out tropicalmba.com. So, Ian, you've promised us updates on the ranch at your new home in Austin, Texas. How's things going for you? Pretty good. Aside from the fact that I feel like I'm just bleeding money getting this thing <laughs> into the shape that I want it to be in. What do you mean by that? You're doing refinishing on the inside? What sort of things are you doing? Yeah, I totally took it down to the studs in half of the house. So meaning that there's exposed two by fours and then now putting the drywall back on, kind of reconfiguring, knocked out some walls, put in some different lighting, completely redid the kitchen. So all the things I think that would make this house more appealing to the next owner, but then also all the things that I want to do to live here. You recently wrote an article about whether or not property is a good investment. And so the question is, are you doing this for really as an investment or are you doing it because you can't stand the color that the old wall was? I mean, it was an older house. So the truth is like I've lived in dirtbag apartments my whole life. So <laughs> I'm very used to not living in a nice place. And so I just saw an opportunity here, I think to increase the value of the property. And we will get into during this podcast whether or not it's going to make a good investment and whether or not your personal residence is really an investment at all. But for me, yeah, I mean, part of it's about aesthetic and part of it's about this is where I live. But honestly, I'm doing it half and half, half for me living here now, and then the other half because I think it will make this a more appealing place for the next people that live here. So this episode is part of our ongoing series on the subject of investing in properties and the many reasons and motivations that different investors have. And so this week, Ian got the chance to jump on Skype with Rob Dix and Rob Bunce. So real quick, I just want to give you a little bit of background about the Robs. Both have been investing in properties in the UK personally for almost a decade. And they also run a business finding and managing properties for other people. And on top of that, they have a very active blog and forum, not unlike our own, like what we're doing with this podcast and the DC. So their podcast is called The Property Podcast. And Ian, you guys were on the phone for a long time, like much longer than we're going to play in just today's episode. How did you enjoy talking to the Robs? Yeah, primarily what we're not playing in here is my insecurities. I was like, how am I screwing up, guys? What have I done? <laughs> we'll get to that. <laughs> but we talked about general property investing, why you might want to invest in properties, some of the different archetypes, people that do invest in property, and just their general feelings on the market and the way that it's going to be going in the future. Yeah, and throughout this conversation, me and you will be coming back in to talk about some of those archetypes and why they may or may not have success with their property investments. So how about you let us know how this thing starts off? So this conversation started by me asking Rob Dix why there seems to be this historical assumption amongst the public that property is a good investment, especially in the US and the UK. It's just in the culture in a way that it's not in large parts of the rest of Europe. But it just seems to be what people grow up getting told. And then either if you already own your own home or if you don't want to do that for whatever reason, but you still believe in property as an investment, you've still got that kind of in you. Then you go, right, then I'm going to buy a rental property and I'm going to rent it out and it's going to go up in value and everything's going to be great. It's just kind of a cultural thing. It also helps that for the last 20 years or more, it's been a very forgiving property market. Even when we had the big crash around 2008, it wasn't as severe as it could have been. And it had come after a huge period of growth. So when we started the podcast about, what, three and a half years ago, at that point, the crash was very, very fresh. And people were still feeling quite nervous about property, I think. And we were sort of trying to have to be like, G people up a bit and be like, it's still okay. But that didn't last very long. Now we're at the point where everything's really booming again. And we're almost having to say, look, calm it down. I don't know what it is, but it just seems to be a cultural thing in a way that you get in not that many other countries. 
in America, I think it's commonplace for people to say like it's a safe place to put your money. It's never historically gone down. So why would it go down in the future? Are these things that you guys believe wholeheartedly, especially that it will never go down? No, the cycles. So property will go down at certain points. And there's reasons why property over the long term goes up. I mean, the UK is a lot easier for us to talk about. In America, I don't quite agree because property prices have dipped after 08 in certain places. You only have to look at Detroit and Las Vegas. But that was really because of supply and demand issues. And that's something that America in certain places has, like New York. But other areas where they can just build and build and build because you have the land is not as restricted. So therefore, I think it's not necessarily built on as much. So I generally, from afar, am a little bit nervous about certain parts of America to invest. But the UK is like a bigger version of New York. We're an island. You know, we've got limited supply of property and we've got a lot of people who want to live here. So because of that, that's why property prices in the UK have gone up over time. Of course, there's peaks and troughs and it goes up and down, but the long trend is up because it's really underpinned by that supply and demand. Tell us a little bit about the types of investment properties that you guys see in the UK. Well, what's interesting is I was listening to the episode you did with Paula Pant from Afford Anything, and she was talking about the 1% rule. Hey, just a quick tip here. If you'd like to listen to that program, you can Google, can you invest in property if you don't have much money? And that's posted at tropicalmba.com slash property. And on many phones, you can just click your phone and see the link right there. It'll be posted in the show notes. Which is something I've seen in real estate blogs and podcasts in the US, where I think the idea is you're meant to make 1% of the property's capital value in rent per month. So if it costs $100,000, you'd be looking to make $1,000 a month in rent. We'd call that a 12% gross yield. But in the UK, there's almost nowhere where you can achieve that. There are some places where it's possible, but those tend to be like the really, really rough areas where you're not going to get a lot of capital growth. You're probably not going to have a lot of luck actually collecting the rent most of the time. But in the US, that seems to be an established thing. But in the UK, the rents are lower. You can still get a decent rental return. But in the UK, it's geared more towards capital growth. You need to make sure you get both. You don't want to just do what people were buying before the crash and just buying stuff on the assumption that it always goes up. I mean, London in particular, because that supply and demand is exaggerated even further, has seen you know 10% plus growth on capital values for a good number of years now. And the rest of the UK follows suit a little bit after London. It seems to be happening now. As Rob said, you can make a little bit of money from rent in the UK, but it's not going to change your life. It's not big sums. The people who invest in, in property in the UK, the ones who make serious wealth from it are the ones who hold it for a long time and take advantage of the capital growth that inevitably seems to happen. I see. So people that are investing in the UK are a little bit less concerned with their rental income, as I should say, less concerned with the rental income as it is going to make them wealthy. Generally speaking, though, do you use that rental income to pay the mortgage? Is that part of the rule of thumb? Is it that it has to cover the mortgage? Because I think that's essentially what the 1% rule is. It's like, hey, I can at least cover my mortgage here with this payment, and then I will get whatever capital growth I get. Yeah. However much you think you're buying for growth, if you're buying on the assumption that the value of the building is going to go up, however strongly you feel that, you need to be making sure that your costs are at least covered. So that's the mortgage, any costs of running it, like a management company if you're using one, maintenance, any other expenses in there, you've got to have those covered and be making money on top. So I wouldn't buy anything that wasn't putting money in my pocket each month in addition to the projected growth over time. People were doing that in the past. People were so enthusiastic about the growth that they were buying properties where they were putting in their own cash to pay the mortgage. And they were like, well, it's fine. I don't mind putting in 50, 100 pounds a month to pay the mortgage because, hey, it's going up by this much every month. And that's great while it's going up. But as we've already said, that's not going to happen forever. Yeah. And the interesting thing about going up is I've always said like trading cars and other things, like it's only worth what someone's willing to pay. And so we were all working on this assumption that it was going up because your neighbor's home sells and the guy across the street's home sells, right? But then one day it all kind of stops and then nothing goes up anymore. And then you think, well, was that really the value of my house? It was the value of my house before this crash, right? But obviously not after the crash. And so we have to deal with these, I guess, inflated prices. But something interesting that you said was, if you feel it will go up, 
Now, I understand in the UK, like you said, you have constricted space requirements, right? So it's like you can only build so much. In the US and other places, there's larger opportunities to kind of expand and grow out. And so how do you quantify feel? Like, I feel like this is going to go up. What kind of metrics do you use? We look at cycles. There's a really interesting theory called the 18-year property cycle, which is put together by an economist called Fred Harrison. His work's really interesting. And what he says is property tends to move in the UK and the US, actually, in 18-year cycles. But the most aggressive growth happens just before the crash. And that's called the winner's curse, where people get into the last two years of that cycle because they've just watched for a long time people making good money through property and they all pile in. And that's when you're looking at your neighbours going, oh, well, it's going up month by month now. Let's try it. Let's get stuck in ourselves. And they're the amateurs and they're the ones who get burned. All right, so we're going to cut in here and play a quick game. By the way, boss man, what's your favorite game? I got to know. Your favorite board game. I haven't played a board game in 10 years. What does that say about me? That says that you're not fun. You're not any fun, I think. Oh. <laughs> My suggestion for a family vacation or hanging out with friends on a Friday night is taboo. It's easy enough for everybody to learn really quick, but it's challenging enough to keep people around the table for a little while. But we're going to play a different kind of game right now, one in which we bring in archetypal characters, because I think it's kind of fun to look at the generalizations of the types of people that get involved in real estate investment. So our first one we'd like to introduce to you is Successful Sam. And the reason I think this is valuable, Dan, is because there's so many different types of people trying to achieve different types of things with their investments. And that's why when I talked to Rob and Rob, it was very hard to kind of nail down, you know, exactly what somebody should do for their precise situation, right? And you kind of have to figure out for yourself what's right. But I think kind of describing people, someone might say, hey, that sounds like me. So first up is successful Sam. He's in his late 20s. He's got a great job as a lawyer making $150,000 a year. Hopefully he lives in the Midwest because if you live in LA or anywhere (laughs) that's expensive, that doesn't seem like much these days. But here's the best part. He's got $100,000 in the bank from all those Christmas bonuses. Nice. Yeah. Successful Sam is definitely the guy that you see over at Reddit, R personal finance. Uh He's like, what do I do? I have $100,000 just sitting in my bank account. I need to start investing in properties, I think. I rent a downtown apartment because he's happy where he wants to live. Maybe he can't necessarily afford to own a condo downtown, but he can certainly afford to rent a condo downtown. So I asked Rob and Rob what successful Sam should buy. Father wears his Sunday best. Mother's tired, she needs a rest. The kids are playing. It's going to come down to different things, but... Most people are restricted by time. As we said, rent isn't really going to make you that wealthy. Even in America where your rents can add up, you're suddenly restricted after you've got so many properties under your belt. You know, your time's getting dragged here, there and everywhere. So what we would probably suggest to young professionals who are time poor is invest in properties that are low maintenance, low risk. So good areas, newer type properties, maybe apartments. They're going to be low risk, not a lot of effort to run and manage Because if you've suddenly got five, six properties and they're all dragging your time and commanding your attention, you're going to come to a point where you just can't push on any further. So really, you want to invest in assets, in property that allows you to build up a reasonable sized portfolio that will make a difference further down the line. That isn't eating up a lot of your time unless you go into it full time, which, of course, you know, someone, a young professional probably doesn't want to. I think that's a key piece of information, though, is like, does this guy who's earning $150,000 a year, does he like his job? Does he want to keep on doing it? Or does he want to get out of that and do something different? Because what we spend most of our time talking about and what Rob was talking about just then was kind of like building an asset base for the future. So you save up money, you buy properties on the side, they run along, they put money in your pocket every month, and then you look in 20 years time and it's like, oh, they're worth more than I paid for them. Great. But then there are obviously loads of other ways of making money from property if you want to. So if you've got 100k in the bank and you really hate your job and you want to go into property full time, well, then you can flip property, you can do loads of other things to kind of generate an immediate income from property. That's a lot harder to do. It's easy to 
lose money doing that. And it's definitely not a stress-free thing to do. Like a lot of people, I think, sitting in their cubicle think, oh, if I could just be a full-time property investor, that's the life for me. But you need to know why you're doing it. It's that goal, like whether you're doing it to have a career or a business in property now versus having an income, a second income and an asset base for the future. They're two separate things. And you really need to be clear on which one you're pursuing in order to know what to buy, where to buy, how to manage it and all that kind of thing. Yeah, it's a great point. I think by picking out a couple archetypes and saying, you know, what should this person do? It really is dependent on what their plans are for their money and what their plan is for their time. I think that a lot of us, we fall into this trap where we have an idea, right? It's like, well, like you said, I've got this $100,000 free cash. I'd like to just be able to sit back and not have to do anything. How realistic is that for a first-time property investor if I picked everything right? Like I picked the location right, I picked the right property management, company. Is this something that you think I'm going to get rich off? Or is this something that's just going to afford me a nice retirement? Or is it something that's going to allow me to go to Disneyland every year? How do you calculate these kinds of investments? It's not something you're going to get rich off. You know, people often make big claims around property, but they're normally people selling courses to say, oh, if you do this and follow my methods, you're going to be extremely rich of property in no amount of time at all. We're kind of the anti that approach that we see that if you want a hands off property investment portfolio, then it is going to be for the long term. You can't have both. You can't have a property portfolio that takes none of your time up and suddenly you're rich overnight and you're retiring. It's just not going to happen. You know, we have multiple businesses and property portfolios. I almost forget I invest in property because it's so easy because you treat that like a business too. You just set up systems, bring in a property management team if you need one, if it's not where you live or you don't want to put the time in. But it's just applying the same principles as you would to a business if you're trying to manage your way out of a business as you would to a property portfolio. Just bring in systems, be smart, be efficient, bring in a team or outsource that team, and you can step away from it on a day-to-day level and literally just spend a few hours every month just checking that everything's coming as it should and do the same the following month after. All right, Ian, let's jump in here to introduce archetype number two. We'll call them Seeking Stability Steve. So Steve is a guy in his mid-30s. He's been renting for a while, and as opposed to successful Sam, Steve actually wants to buy some place to live, maybe even to nest. Rather than an investment, he wants and needs to know that it's at least an okay place to park some money. And you know, Steve sounds a lot like Ian. What? (laughs) Did you write this about me? (laughs) Sorry, man. I just thought you could be a Steve. But Steve does have the approach, or at least the mindset that I had, which is, yeah, I'd like to invest somewhere where I want to live. Yeah, and you wrote 6,000 words on this rationale as well, which is a nice compliment to this episode. So if you relate to Stability Steve's or Ian's situation, highly recommend you go to Google the real cost of buying a house and check out Ian's recent article at thetropicalmba.com. But it's probably more interesting that we hear our guests' feedback on what you've done because they're the experts. Well, what do you think of me in Cypress Creek now, Marge? It does seem nicer than Springfield. Yeah. Did you notice how the people weren't shoving or knocking each other down? I've never been to a place like that before. (laughs) Me neither. I want to talk about two things. First, I want to talk about a personal residence and when someone should, quote, invest in a personal residence. And then I want to talk about the appreciation rates that you can expect from some of these investment properties. Well, I'm going to jump in really quick and talk about reading that post, what I think you did right when it came to that investment, because then Rob B will have to talk about the other side of it (laughs) and where our thinking diverges from yours. Nicely set up, Rob. I like that. The great thing about that was that you secured the property for less than it was worth because you looked at the motivation of the guy who was selling and you kind of realized that whatever your realtor was telling you or whatever the market was saying, this was a guy who was motivated to sell. So you knew that you could get that property at a good price. And that's one of the great things about property. You can't do that with lots of other assets. So like if you're investing in stocks or bonds, like if you're trying to buy a share in a company, the person selling that share might be desperate to sell it today because they need to pay their bills or they might not be that bothered about selling, but you don't know. That's a real strength of property. And so it's important to utilize that, which you did. And also the fact that you used a mortgage, even though you didn't need to, because you were looking at the opportunity cost of having that cash tied up, using leverage in the form of debt responsibly is something we talk about 
about a lot. That's another strength of property investment that you don't get with many other asset classes. So you kind of made use of the big advantages of property investment. But I think where we might diverge a bit is, Rob, I don't know, but I wouldn't necessarily think about it as an investment at all with it being a primary residence. This is where you bring me in to give the bad news. Good cop, bad cop. (laughs) The bad news or where we disagree on your position is I don't see your home as an investment. And we are personal residents. Rob Rents, I've recently purchased my own home as well. But my own home, even though it was a significant financial outlay and I believe it will go up in value over time, I don't consider it as an investment and I don't look at it as an investment in my wider portfolio. And that's for a few reasons. One, Rob mentioned earlier that the important thing about property is making sure that you're getting a bit of rental income. It might not change your life, but you still want it to be paying you. Your property isn't paying you. It might go up, but it might not. So if it doesn't go up, you still want to pay you each month because otherwise it's not an asset, it's a liability. You're paying into that property every month through your mortgage and running costs and it's eating away at your wealth rather than adding to it. You're making an assumption that it'll go up in value, which is great, and hopefully it does. But if it doesn't, actually, it's a poor investment. The other thing is, with your own home, you rarely, and this is not just you, this applies to everyone, you rarely pick a property because you think it's in the best investment location. You want to live there as well. So you make a compromise on the area because it might not be the best place to invest, but it's a quite nice place to live. So you're making compromises on the area in many cases when you move into your own home. And you make emotional decisions around the things you put in that property. So you might spend a bit more on a kitchen than you would if it was a rental property. You might make the bathroom a little swankier than it needs to be, but you're going to live there. So it's for you. So that feels nice. So all the time you're plowing money into that property and hopefully it goes up in value, but it might not. And every month is cost, not income. It's just cost, cost, cost. And hopefully your property will go up enough to offset that cost. But You've already worked out from your numbers that even assuming that it carries on going up every year, the return's going to be minimal. So I don't see, and I know it's been for both of us, we don't see property investment when you invest in your own home as an investment. In fact, it's just property. This is interesting, right? Because when we start talking about the personal residence, like the tone of the conversation gets a little slower, like it's not going to be as good. It might not go up. But then when we're talking about investment properties, like places that you rent out, then it's like, well, the market should go up. We anticipate it will be good. So what's the difference? Is it just the rental income? The rental income's huge because whether it goes up or down, you're still getting paid. But the other thing is when you invest, you remove all emotion out. So you're looking for the areas where you think is going to give the best uplift. So there might be an area in America that you think potentially has a stronger uplift, but you just don't want to live there. Those compromises that you start to make when you go for your own residential property is where people fall down. But you're going to be more efficient as an investor if you're picking for an investment without the emotion. So you're picking the right area, the right tenant profile, spending the right type of money on the property, not overspending on it, just getting the spec up to the level it needs to be for the rental market. All these unemotional decisions you start to make means that from very early on, you've got a better investment on your hands. And you're right, it might not go up in value as well. But if it doesn't, at least you're being paid. Here we go. Now we're getting somewhere. So we take out the emotion. That's step number one. (laughs) Step number two, and this is one of the things that I think is interesting, especially in America, is sometimes it seems like you have to invest in a place that you don't live. I live in Austin. Is Austin a great place for a real estate investment? I don't know. I'm not an expert at that. But is a place like Atlanta even better? Let's just, for the sake of argument, say yes. I think most people are more likely, although that might be the case, to invest in Austin because they're closer to it in proximity. Do you guys see this a lot? Is this where people fail? They invest in a place where they live, where they should be investing somewhere else? Typically, people do tend to invest near where they live. And I think that's natural. But it is very, very unlikely that you live in the best possible location for investment. So if you want to make the best possible investment, then maybe you do have to go away from where you live. Now, the US is much bigger than the UK. Like in the UK, you're probably never more than three, four hours away maximum if you did want to go there for whatever reason. So it's pretty easy. If you live in the south of England and you think the north of England is where it's at, it's pretty easy to go and spend a couple of weekends there, pounding the streets, getting to know the place, meeting people locally, educating yourself. There's an absolute ton that you can find out about a place online. And then you can go and make an informed decision. 
And that does mean that you can't necessarily be hands-on in terms of going there and fixing stuff when it breaks and all that kind of thing. So you're incurring costs in terms of management. But then if you're viewing it as an asset and it's not your business, then that's a healthy thing to do anyway. There's probably a better use of your time in terms of generating wealth than there is going and fixing a leaky tap or whatever it is. I like that you guys are framing this as a business and being strategic and leaving your emotions out of it because that's, hey, that's what we do in business a lot of times is we try and remove our emotions from the situation so we can make good decisions about our futures. I want to get back and talk real quick about some of these numbers and what to expect. And I know every market is different, but let's say I get a couple rental properties and we can use UK as an example. What do you guys think are the long-term opportunities in terms of my financial positions right now? So if I was to get into, I don't even know, an apartment complex, a house, whatever it may be, give me a couple different scenarios on what you would expect that to produce for me. I would say that as a general rule of thumb in the UK, If you are using like a moderate level of debt in the form of a mortgage, but not too much, and assuming a fairly typical kind of cost profile and an average area, you could probably make, say, like an 8 to 10% annual return on the cash that you've invested without too much difficulty. Then on top of that, you've got whatever the market does in terms of going up over the long term. There'll be dips along the way, but you'd expect it to at least keep pace with inflation. And in the UK, probably more because of the supply and demand issue. You can do a lot better than that. But in order to do that, you're often looking at investments where they're either a bit more risky or they involve more of your time. In the UK, a lot of people will buy houses and rent them out individually room by room. Also, there's things like Airbnb. If you're renting out as a holiday let, you can make more money. But There's marketing costs, there's changeovers, there's all that kind of thing as well. But if you were taking your real kind of set and forget, low risk, just buy it, watch the rent come in, see where it is in the future, 8 to 10% annual return on your cash from the rent, I'd say is probably a fair benchmark. Just from the rent. So that's no property appreciation. Right. Okay. And so let's talk about two different factors there. One is what percentage of the mortgage would you put up? So basically, give me an example of how much the house costs and how much I should put down and then how much I should finance. The second thing is, has it always been 8 to 10%? Give me a little bit of historical background and how long that's been the case and how long in the future you think that will be the case. The amount you will put down, so let's say you go for a property that's $100,000. In the UK, you will put 25% down of your own cash and you would get a mortgage for 75% of it, so 75000 So that's a typical leverage point. Of course, you can do less than that, and in some cases, you can go a bit higher, but that's where most people tend to place themselves when going for a mortgage in the UK. You're probably somewhere between 4 to 6%, but there are areas of the UK that you can get over 12%. Historically, the lower end, it's been where you can, in some areas, make a loss each month because the property prices have been so high, and that's probably an indicator that the market's a little overheated and possibly due a correction. But after a crash, double-digit returns are possible. It's been a while since we've had one now, but after a crash happens, the higher returns are possible because people are fearful. And if you're brave, a time to consider property because you can get much higher returns. And it's worth saying that what we're talking about here is the return that you make after all costs. And for that reason, it's dangerous to generalize. And I always do it reluctantly because not only do you get huge variations, but also people have different opinions of costs. So you're borrowing with a mortgage. Well, like what interest rate are you paying on that? What's the interest rate now? What's it going to be in the future? Are you using a property management company? So you ask for a benchmark and I think that's a fair one, but it is always dangerous to generalize because it is going to be different for everyone and everyone comes into it with different assumptions. And you've got to remember that you're basing all this on projections of like what your likely costs are going to be and what the likely rental income is going to be. But you're definitely going to be wrong to some degree. Whatever you map out on your spreadsheet before you buy is definitely not going to be 100% wrong. You just don't know how wrong it's going to be or in which direction. This makes a lot of sense in terms of the numbers, guys, and why you're so hesitant to give exact numbers on what you should expect. Because like you said, it's completely different depending on your situation, how your time in the market, what you expect to get out of it. You know, I've got other questions written down here for you guys, like what should my debt to principal ratio be on my first, second, and fifth home? You know, things like this. But what I'm hearing from you guys is that it's extremely dependent on the different variables, and there seem to be a lot of them. 
in terms of what your desired outcome is. So when someone comes to you and they say, Rob and Rob, I'd like to get into property investing, it seems like one of the first questions you ask them is, what is your desired outcome? And so given all these potential scenarios, how do you clamp down on what your strategy should be? What are some of the questions that I should be asking myself about the future to know how to invest in property? A big one that people always seem to forget is how much time are you going to put into this? Because people want the best returns, but they don't want to put any time in, and the two don't often match up. Also, how much capital are you going to put in, and the time frames overall that you're willing to commit to property. Some people want to get in and out within a couple of years, so you're going to have to do a lot more risky property investment to benefit from that if you're going to go in for a very short space of time. If you're in it for the long term, then you can relax because, yes, the property might dip at some point, but you know it'll come back and end up going back up again. So the pressures of short-term dips and pressures don't apply as much. So it's how much are you going to put into the deal? How much time are you going to put into your portfolio? How much time are you going to invest in property overall? You know, is it one year? Is it 20 years? All these things will make huge differences to how you approach property investment. Here's our final archetype for this program, number three. Let's call her Beach House Barbara. Woohoo! Wicker furniture. Love it. I got a vision. You got a vision for this one? I got a vision. Whitewashed wood and, and wicker furniture. <laughs> so Barbara had a family, but the kids are grown up, and she's starting to think about, on the one hand, retirement from a financial perspective, but also from a family perspective, wouldn't it be great to have a place that everyone could gather I know this is something I've certainly thought about in my future. In the U.S., we all know people who have bought rather than rented a seasonal home, which all the family use, and then maybe if your family doesn't completely overrun the place, you can rent it out to turn it into a profitable property. <laughs> these condos are interesting in the United States because they are in these communities, these beach communities, especially on the East Coast where people don't really live full time. They live there part time or they let it out. And so it's like, I always wonder about these places. It's like, does anybody really live there full time? I think there is a glamour attached to being a property investor saying, oh, I own property and I'm a property investor. It's nowhere near as exciting as it seems from the outside. I can tell you it's pretty dull, actually, once you get up and running and the excitement of the initial deal wears off quite quickly. You're right, though. Everyone knows somebody who's done well from property investment or heard of someone that's done well. And because of that, I think people will always be attracted to it. And there's always these mantras that, you know, invest in property, invest in bricks and mortar. These are things that are recited over and over through generation to generation. It goes on and on and on. And unless there's a massive cultural shift, I can't see it changing anytime soon. So people will be attracted to it. People are attracted to it, though, for the wrong reasons sometimes, because they want the easy wins, the quick wealth. And really, yes, it can happen. And sometimes it might, but they've really, really got lucky in most cases. The majority of people who invest in property are in it for the long term, will make a nice income, but it's not life changing stuff. I think you raised an interesting point when you were looking at property investments and you said, why would you invest in property when you can get a bigger return from business? Yeah. So like in our previous business, we were getting 20% year over year on our money. And the scenarios I'm hearing from you, and these might be conservative, are like 8 to 10% in the UK. The point is that not many people can run and build businesses. You are a business owner, you're an entrepreneur, you can build businesses, you know how to do it, you've proven that, and you surround yourself with other people who've proven it and done it as well. But actually, most people can't do that. Business isn't for everyone. Not everyone can run and build a successful business. Whereas in property, it's accessible to more people. It's easier to get started. It's easier for them to jump in. And yes, the returns aren't as high, but it's easier for them to get their heads around, understand, and build a portfolio slowly. If you could do both, MJ DeMarco from The Millionaire Fast Lane, he talks about building businesses and then investing in assets on the side. That's the dream scenario. We do that. But however you do it, I think building a business is not an easy win for the majority of people, whereas property, it's just a little easier to get into and it's easier to understand and easier to build slowly a successful portfolio. 
I guess what you're saying as well in there is that most of the value is actually generated by the market. If you're a halfway decent or smart property investor, you just follow some of these formulas. And as long as the market does what it's supposed to do, and as long as you do what you're supposed to do, you're going to get those types of returns. Whereas in a business, a lot of times, some of the value is derived from the market, but in some ways, the value is derived from how you build that business out building these machines that bring in money from scratch a lot of times is, you're right, probably harder than letting the market do what it's going to do and kind of riding that wave. I agree with that, with the caveat that with property, you can build in value at the start by getting a good deal. So that's a very difficult thing to do. Most people fail to do it. And it does take a lot of time in finding the right opportunities. But you can kind of like build in that equity cushion at the start if you can do what you did and secure a property for less than it's worth. I think another of these things that you hear when people are trying to pimp property is, you know, look at how many of the world's richest people made their money in property. And no, I don't think that's the case. It's like you can look at it, these people who are very wealthy and you can see how much property they hold. But for the most part, they're storing their wealth in property rather than generating their wealth in property. And that's an important distinction. If you are business minded and you've got hands on skills, you can have an active property business in fixing up properties and selling them on and all that kind of thing. There are loads of businesses that you can have around property. We're kind of saying like, yeah, when you've made your money from your business or with the savings from your job, what do you invest in? Property can be part of that mix as an asset class like the stock market or like whatever else. You mentioned something that I did right. It doesn't sound like I did everything right. I appreciate you guys pointing that out. One thing that you can do right is buy below market value. One of the ways that I did that, and I explained in the article that I wrote, was part of the way that I did that, it was just not caring. Like we mentioned before, taking the emotion out of the situation, even though know, this was a place that I really wanted to live, I thought was very cool. I thought, you know what, there's probably more of these out there. I'm just going to give the offer that I feel like I should be giving. And also, yeah, I had a little bit of that feeling like if I can buy under market value, then this is a little bit of a safer bet. And so how do you generally go about buying a property under market value if that's part of the equation? It's not easy, but it's easy to say it and harder to do. You're right. You have to be unemotional. You have to be prepared to put plenty of offers in, but you need to find someone that's motivated. Again, people aren't going to knock on your door and say, hi, I'm motivated. Do you want to take my property off me for a song? It's not going to happen. People sometimes make it seem like it's easy. You can work with companies in the UK, which look and source properties that way. And that's fine. So you can outsource that process. But if you want to do it yourself, it's just a case of networking, building relationships with your local real estate agents or your local estate agents, as we call them in the UK letting agents, letting them know that you're an investor, you're after a deal, you're not emotional about the property of where it is, you just want to buy a property below market value that's going to give a good rental return. By working on those relationships and building your network, it is possible to do it yourself. For example, for me, what I did was I opened up redfin.com or realtor.com. Those are two of the sites that I would use in the United States. I clicked on the amount of land that I wanted. I clicked on the size of house that I wanted, and then I blew the map up. And I looked to see how many homes in that area were at the price that I was thinking about purchasing for. And that was kind of it. I mean, as somebody that's not a professional necessarily doing this every day, that was kind of the best tool that I had. So what are your ideas on how to understand if you're buying a property underneath market value? Yeah, what you did is pretty much it. I mean, in the UK, we have different tools. So there's the land registry, which is the official record of the centralized record of what every property has sold for and when. You can access that through tools like Rightmove, which I think is a bit like Zillow and things like that. The best you can do is look at not just what's on the market now, but what properties have sold for. So if you imagine that you're buying an apartment and last week, the apartment next door, which is identical in every way, sold for 100000 then you can be pretty sure that that's the market value of the one that you're looking at buying, right? You're very rarely going to have something that's that precise. So you're going to be looking at properties that are slightly different in terms of their condition, the size, the kind of the features that they have in terms of outdoor space and all that kind of thing, and when it sold. So like whether it was last month or a year ago. So you're kind of using this historical data and piece it together as best you can to come to your best estimate of what it's going to be worth today. A lot of people make the mistake of taking 10% off the asking price and going, wow, I got it below market value. But the asking price is not necessarily the same as market value. They're two completely different things.
For me, it's always interesting to hear about other people's strategies, and in particular, Rob Dix and Rob Bunces are based on nearly a decade of experience in the UK market, which is slightly different from the US, largely due to the size of the country from what I can understand, but there's still plenty of parallels in terms of mindset and strategy. So what's the big takeaway here, Ian? Is it that you shouldn't see your home as an investment? I mean, what do you think about that? I think the cynical person would look at all you've done and just said, well, you know, it's not really an investment. You just bought yourself something you wanted. You bought yourself a home. What's wrong with that? Why do you got to turn it into some big investment? Yeah. So a couple of things that I took away from this podcast. In, in terms of my investment, I think, yeah, a personal residence, I'm not sure if it can be considered an investment. You know, One of the reasons why I think people call it an investment in the United States is because historically speaking, it has gone up in value tremendously, especially if you lived in somewhere like the Bay Area, where you bought your home back in the 80s for less than $200,000, 1,400 square feet, and now you're selling it for $850,000. But it's one of those things, Dan, it's like kind of like an accidental investment. And so can you really call it an investment? Because none of these people, I don't think, predicted that that was going to happen or else they would have bought 20 of these houses. And certainly there were companies and people that did do that with the anticipation that it would go up to the value that it is today. But I think the average person buying a house is not doing it for an investment. I look at it more as a way to store cash in a safe place that I can also enjoy and live in. But what I really took away from the Robs is that there are so many different ways to invest in property. And here's what I think is cool about that is depending on your threshold for risk, there is a lot of ways to get into the property game. I think that that's pretty cool because Dan, we talk a lot about like the legibility of business opportunities. And for me, like the property thing, you know, talking to Rob and Rob is pretty legible. I feel like all the information that you need is available and relatively inexpensive to get into property investing. And so a lot of times we'll say like, well, is it really any opportunity there because it's so legible? And I think the answer is like, yes, this can be a vehicle for you and your retirement potentially. Yeah. And I think we can also take a lesson from Rob and Rob. And by the way, if you like the way they roll like we do, if you like what they said today, do check out the property podcast. Because there's so many people that see this as an investment opportunity, it's a huge market in and of itself to serve. Like you don't have to be an investor. You can serve the investors, right? There's so many services and podcasts, like the property podcast and a milieu of things aimed at property investors. So I think there's always going to be opportunities there. This is a gigantic market. We'd love to hear what you think about the ideas brought up in this podcast. We're going to post the show notes and links to everything discussed at tropicalmba.com slash property podcast. And again, big thanks to the Robs for coming on the show and enduring Ian's intense questioning, I'd like to call it. And also we have a lot more from this interview that we hope to air in the future. So as promised, we'll be back talking about property shortly and continue to receive updates from Ian about the ranchette. We still calling it the ranchette? That's what you guys call it. You get like a branded sign outside. <laughs> Casa de Boss Man. That's what you guys call it. <laughs> well, Dan, I'm getting ready to hop on a plane here, going to our biggest event of the year in Bangkok, DCBKK. Super excited to see you in just a few hours. See you in a few hours, and we'll see you guys next Thursday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hey, thanks for listening to the Tropical MBA podcast. You can go to tropicalmba.com, get access to hundreds of of back episodes and all kinds of other goodies. Load up your iPod. That is the cheapest way to fly business class on your next international flight. We will see you next Thursday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time.